So folks, welcome to part one on chapter three, managing system projects. This is where the rubber hits the road. So what makes a good systems analyst or project manager? Their ability to manage. I mean, it really is that simple. Their ability to effectively communicate between technical and non-technical employees or team members that are involved, you name it, this is where things happen. So chapter objectives, we'll skip through these real quick. If you want, you can pause on this. We're going to talk about those scheduling tools. So, you know, what shapes a project? Well, first of all, what makes a project successful? You know, is it that it's completed on time within budget? It meets the requirements that were detailed? Um, or does it simply satisfy users? Or perhaps it does all of this. Now, as we talk about this, it doesn't mean that we have to meet each and every requirement. You know, a project that is 30 days late, say it's an 18 month project and it's 30 days late, but it's delivered, it satisfies users, it meets budget, maybe it went a little bit over budget. Well, if it was late, it definitely went over budget. But that doesn't mean that the project isn't successful. How we really determine if a project is successful is by taking the time to audit the project once it's been put into place. Now, this can be 30 days later. This can be 90 days later. It can even be a year later where we go back and say, okay, here's what the project was. Here was the scope. Here was the budget. Here was the estimated revenue or cost savings for this project. How did we do? And by doing that, we have some unequivocal facts as to the success of that project, right? So hopefully that makes sense. So you know, the project triangle, you know, what is cost, scope, and time. So usually one of these is fixed. You know, the budget can be cast in stone. The um, scope can be cast in stone or the schedule. So, you know, we have to fix something. We can't have just a bunch of variables as we do these projects. So what does a project manager do? Well, leadership, leadership, leadership. You get it. Planning, scheduling, communication. They're a manager, an effective manager does all these same things. So, you know, planning, identify the project tasks and estimate the completion time and cost of each. Um, the ability to adjust, you know, if one of those tasks falls behind, it's going to affect the whole project. So how could I adjust, you know, based on one task? Is it a sequential task? We'll talk more of that later. Or is it possible for me to go on with other aspects of the project? while still getting this one done, you know, unsuccessfully, who knows, but it needs more time. You know, one of the things we really want to manage is scope creep. Okay. That's where, as we do the project, we figure out, okay, this is what we set out to do, but boy, if we could now do this or, you know, if it could do that. So if it could have 10 more reports run, whatever the case may be, those are things that are going to slow down the project in the aspect of time and scope and, of course, cost. Anytime we increase time, we increase cost. Anytime we increase scope, we increase cost. So project scheduling, you know, create a specific timetable that shows tasks, task dependencies. We need to be able to present to management the time it's going to take to complete the project. And, of course, that may get adjusted as the project scope changes as an increase of time, maybe we lose a key employee of the project, we now need to replace them, whatever the case may be. So project monitoring, very important, you know, supervising, asking those team members, you know, how's the workload? Are you getting your portions of the project done? You know, remember that if we're late with one, that tends to cascade across the project and make us late with other things. So we have to be careful. Now, one of the biggest challenges that people tend to do when a project gets late or it starts to cost more or the scope is they throw more resources at it, more time, more money, more people. And as we'll see, that may not be such a great idea. So keep that in mind. Uh, project reporting. So create regular progress reports You know, for management, for users, for project team themselves. Let's not forget that as we report to management, we also want to report to the team. The team needs to be kept aware of where this project is at, what time it's taking. So in your project, um, in your chapter material, there's a great video by Ralph Phillips on creating a Gantt chart in Excel. 
definitely look at that. Gantt chart is a graphical representation. Notice Henry L. Gantt almost 100 years ago shows planned and actual progress on a project. We can pick time frames and say, here's where we are today. Have we finished the things that are on the left hand side? Are we ready and prepared to work on the things that are on the right? So sometimes we'll see that done with two lines. This is today's date. This is where we are, but this is where we are in the project. It could be ahead of today's date or it could be uh, behind today's date. So time usually displayed in the horizontal axis and tasks shown on a vertical axis. So here's an example of a Gantt chart. Uh, you know, within projects. So we have a Gantt chart. These are the different tasks. We would, of course, give them better names, more descriptive names. This is how long the task should take. Again, here's what I was talking about. Here's the current date. But let's say we were here. You know, here's where our project is. We might have another line that represents where we are at in the project. Now, what we'd like to see, of course, is those two lines lining up. If those two lines are lining up, then the project manager or analyst is doing their job, they're keeping things on time, and the folks involved in the project are getting the work done on a timely basis. So going back a little bit, there's a better way. Now, a Gantt chart, by the way, is a great way to display to management, to end users. It's easy to read. This is where we're at. But it doesn't give all the detail. Now, one of your assignments this week will be to create a PERT CPM chart. Uh, it might be this week or next because you're going to do it on the personal trainer project. And I'll give you ample information for that. So a PERT CPM, you know, developed by the U.S. Navy, you know, critical path method, you know, similar to a PERT. Both methods now have been combined. OK, so. Where a Gantt chart offers a valuable snapshot, PERT gives us more detail. It's better for monitoring. It gives us more task-related detail within boxes. And it gives us that structure to know, is this a, a task that we're doing concurrently at the same time as other tasks? Or is this sequential where we have to finish this task before we can start the next? So detailed boxes. Here's a little example of a um, work breakdown structure. So here is a Gantt chart. This would be more of a PERT CPM. Each of these boxes would have some data in it. Okay. So we give it a task ID. We give it a start date and a finish date. Now, a lot of times we do these in what's called work days. Okay. So we break stuff down into work days. That's normally an eight hour shift. Okay. So as we talk about duration, one day, we're talking about eight hours. Now, keep in mind as we do this, we have to take into consideration weekends, right? So keep in mind to, to consider weekends. Are, are, is work going to be done on weekends? Most likely not. So, you know, here we go where here we have this task, task one. It can be, um, it is sequential, which means we have to finish it before we do task two and task five. OK, but task two and task five can be done concurrently, according to this chart. And then once we finish task five, well, it's done. It, you know, its dependency is on task six. So we come up to task two. We see that task three and four are dependent on the completion of task two, but that three and four can be done concurrently. So we're going to do an example of this. It'll make more sense when we apply it to our personal trainer project. So. We identify tasks in a, in a work breakdown uh, structure, WDS. That really is a, um, a PERT CPM chart that we were building there. It must be a clearly identify each task, include the estimated duration, a start date, an end date, or a start day, an end day. You'll see them done both ways. You know, what is the task, a description of the task. We give it a task ID. Sometimes in a lot of detailed projects, we will have a main task like build database, and then we'll have subsequent tasks that are done underneath there. So we'll actually explode that task to show subsequent tasks, um, you know, such as the design, the development, the actual implementation in the logical, say, database, the testing, 
and then finally implementation. So that might be say task one and those subsequent tasks or buried tasks would be 1.1, 1 1.2, 1 1.3. And yes, we could go as far as 1.1.1.1, for example. So keep that in mind, um, especially as we deal with complex projects. So tasks, they're basic units of work, project manager plans, it's scheduled monitors. Normally tasks might be for a subsequent programming team or for an individual that's going to complete that task. So sometimes we see the addition of the who is involved in the task, okay, as we do that work breakdown structure. So create a work breakdown structure where you start with a work questionnaire, you prepare the questionnaire. So this is this is an example of a work breakdown structure for a questionnaire for survey. Okay, so we prepare the questionnaire. Um, we might work through this process a few times. Finally, someone approves it. We, dis we distribute it. All questions are distributed, all the questionnaires. So in the case of personal trainer, this might be out to all of the locations. We wait for the return, i.e. we've completed the questionnaires. We gather all the data together. We tabulate. We see what the results are. We may do this graphically by tabulating. We prepare a report on what the findings of the questionnaire were. So this is a main task. Okay, so this might be, you know, task 1.0, asking the question, is this a project, for example? We, we do this on the project just to say, is this project viable? What is the goals of the project, for example? Um, if the project is customer satisfaction, we would do that. Now, keep in mind, as you do the personal trainer project, we are not looking for our customers satisfied. We're asking questions about the project. Now, this might be, would a customer use a mobile app if we had a mobile app? But we're not really worried about, are they satisfied with their gym experience? Are they satisfied with that? We are focusing on the project. So as we come up with questions, they're related to the project, not customer satisfaction, not do you necessarily want daycare, but if we offered a mobile app, if we offered online access, would you pay your bill online if that was an option? Those kind of things. So keep that in mind. So we create that structure. You know, here's a nice uh, task table. Uh, this might be where we start in Excel. So reserve a meeting room, order the marketing materials, brief the manager, send out customer emails, burn sample DVDs, you know, load the new software, whatever the case may be. Okay. And then these, of course, can be breaking, broken down and listing predecessor tasks. So you know, tasks that need to be done uh, before or after that kind of thing. So decide how long each task takes. Now we'll talk about a formula to estimate this because where we get this, the, this information, where we really get good at how long a task takes is based on history. How long did it take last time did we did it? Or how long does the professional website developer who's done this task before, how long does he or she think it's going to take to do that? So tasks can be hours, days, or weeks. Again, normally on a PERT CPM, we're gonna do by days. OK, um, but if it's a short project, we can do hours. We can if it's a long project, hey, we're going to spend eight weeks designing a database, for example. You know, units of measure called person days. That's what I was talking about. One person day is a standard eight hour shift. Now, keep in mind that if this is a person in your organization who already has a job, a one person day may be that we're committed to working on this project two hours a day. OK, so suddenly we say, OK, if they need eight hours to do this and they're only working on the project two hours a day and we've detailed that, then we're going to need the four days to complete that task. So whenever we pick one of these, that's what we stay with. We're not going to move from one task to hours and another task to days, whatever the case may be. So keep that in mind. Things that affect duration, certainly project size. You know, as you'll learn by the reading in your book, as a project grows, the demands on the project, the demands on the people grow exponentially. So here's how I'm going to uh, describe that to you. All right, so we got a blank slide here. 
And that blank slide just reminded me to call up this Word document. So we're now looking at a Word document, and I'm going to show you how the complexity of a project grows. So basically, we've got this person here. They're going to be working on the project, okay? And we're going to add a person over here. They're also going to work on the project, sorry. And we'll add one more up here. Now, if we have a project with three people, this is a great way to, to demonstrate this. We have a project with three people, and we're going to just talk communication between these people. So whatever it is, sharing data, working on projects, communicating. So I'm going to do communication, and I'm going to show you that we basically have three communication channels that need to be taken place for these folks to work together and successfully complete a project. Now, let's see what happens if we come in here and we just add one more person. So again, pardon my little, I'm doing this with a mouse. There we go. We have one more person. And of course, now we need to add the communication channels for that one more person. So suddenly this person's gonna need to communicate with that person. They're gonna need to communicate with that person and this person, right? So we just added one more person and look what happened to our communication channels. With three people, we had three communication channels. Now we added a fourth and we have one, two, three, four, five, six communication channels. So imagine what happens. You can do the math if we add one more person here. So that's just an example of how the complexity of a project can grow exponentially depending on the size and the scope and the detail of the project. So displaying work breakdown structure, you know, experience with similar projects, we talked about that. This is where the value of that systems analyst comes in. They have experience, so they know how much things cost, they know how much time it takes, they know how many consulting man hours might be, but we only get this from experience. Now, keep, keep in mind, that doesn't mean it has to be experience on successful projects, we may have have learned from projects that fail. You know, you've heard that, right? You know, when you fall, you get back up. When you fall, you get back up. Um, the only reason you're not going to succeed is if you decide not to get back up. So constraints to the project or conditions or restrictions or requirements that the system must satisfy. So, you know, example of that might be that the system needs to be able to process two terabytes of data in a query, you know, in under three hours. Well, okay, that's a constraint. You know, why does that constraint exist? Well, because we know that's how big the database is, and we know we need these reports in three hours, so we need to build hardware structure that's going to meet that or distribute the data or do whatever needs to be done to meet that constraint. Another constraint might be um, we need to be able to, to have a web-based application that 2,500 consecutive users can utilize the system with XYZ performance, you know, at the same time. So keep that in mind as a constraint. So define system requirements that can be achieved realistically, you know, within the required constraints. So a required constraint may be a limited budget. It may be a limited resources, and we need to figure out how to work within those constraints. So as we come back to a work breakdown structure, if you notice, here's the one we saw, here's the days, we bring this over into a Gantt chart, here's what it looks like, okay? Now again, a Gantt chart is a basic representation. We could take this same information, let me go back here, and we could apply it to a PERT chart, okay? Now what we need to know is predecessor task, and we can see here, you know, that these are concurrent, but these are, pre, you know, predecessed on this, et cetera. So what are task patterns? Well, it depends on, you know, depend on each other and must be performed in sequence. So that's a pattern sequentially, you know, multiple predecessor tasks, you know, i.e. what can be done at the same time as a task, what can be done prior to the task, or needs to be done prior to the task, and what can be done post a task, for example. So task boxes, you know, we start creating a model, we'll be looking at that. Uh, I give you a video again on how to do this in PERT. So this is a PERT CPM, we're gonna give it a task name. Now that task name should stand alone, so we're not gonna call this DB task. What the heck is DB task? Well, you know, create database. 
okay? And then subtasks for that. So task ID, that way we can find it, the task duration, start date, and end date. Now, one of the things that I'll explain in that video about creating a PERT CPM chart is make sure you count on your fingers. And what I mean by that is whatever the finish day is of one task, we can't start the next task until the next day. So if this one takes five days, for example, let's say, you know, start day and end day, task duration is the fifth day, we would start any sequential tasks or subsequent tasks on the sixth day. So hopefully that makes sense to you. So what are main types of task patterns? Well, dependent tasks, that's where one task, so prepare, outline, create document. Well, we need to prepare the outline before we can create the document. Okay, so yeah, it's sort of similar to a relay race. You know, we have to have one person run around the track and then we'll take the baton and we'll do our part. So um, other types, so multiple successor tasks. Well, develop a plan, but we can arrange interviews and start designing the survey at the same time. Okay, so these are uh, successor tasks that require the development plan to be done first. Now, there can be many, many tasks, okay, that are done at the same time. Uh, predecessor tasks, so here's, you know, before we can conduct interviews, we have to obtain authorization and create a job description. Those have to be done before we can conduct interviews. What I would do is put something in between here. We're going to obtain authorization. We're going to create a job description. We're then going to approve the job description. Okay, see the more detail there, and then conduct interviews. So those are predecessor tasks. So how do I identify task patterns? Well, words like then, when, or, and, etc. So here's the idea of when we are done with this task, then we can do task three and four, right? So those are going to be done um, together or coinciding after the predecessor task was done. So when task two is finished, start two tasks, task three and task four, describes multiple successor tasks that can be both started as soon as task two is finished. So you can read through that other one and pause the video. So once we do all this, we start putting these into a pattern. And as you can see, imagine just creating a quick little Android app. How would that look to create an Android app? And how much project detail might we have? Well, let's see, you know, first of all, we have an idea. Uh, we might have to take that idea uh, further along. We might want to do a survey to make sure that we have a viable market for that idea. Uh, we then get funding for the idea. We then turn around and do interviews of our potential market, find out what they would like, find out what kind of changes, find out what kind of user interface they want. Then we start designing the user interface and we do the programming for that and we do the code for the behind end. Does it connect to a server? Do we need to build that structure? You can see just how quickly these things can get very complex. Let's not forget to do something crazy like testing, etc. So, so we've done step one and two. I'm going to stop this video. We're at 20 minutes and I'll come back and do step three in the next video. Y'all take care.